Good afternoon. Our next lecture for the day is about pediatric urology. The first condition that we will be discussing is hypospadia. This is a condition which was which may be considered a form of incomplete maturation of the genitalia. It's a common abnormality that occurs in one out of 250 to 300 newborn boys in the US. So the most obvious aspect of hypospadias is urethral opening that is not the tip of the of the glands. And 70 to 80 percent of affected babies will have a meatus on the mid to distal shaft or proximal glands. A lesser number will have more proximal openings whether penoscrotal, scrotal, or perineal. So in addition to the abnormality located in the meatus, boys usually have deficient ventral foreskin associated with penile curvature more common in the severe varieties and is referred to as cordy. So this is how a uh, hypospagus looks like. So the, the glands opening is not located in the normal position, which is at the tip of the glands. So it could be in the glandular, the subcoronal, distal, mid shaft, proximal, penoscrotal, and the most uh, distal or most proximal uh, opening would be the scrotal. So the distribution is about 70% anterior and 30% in the penile or the, in the posterior area. There are no diagnostic studies needed for the majority of the boys with hypospadias as there is typically no increased risk of renal or bladder anomalies. So children with associated cryptorchidism, especially with proximal hypospadias, and a non-palpable uh, testis have an increased risk of having a coexisting disorder of sexual differentiation and need to undergo a thorough evaluation including hormonal studies, karyotyping, and pelvic ultrasonography. So distal hypospadias can usually be repaired in one stage with success rates of greater than 95%. So most would advocate a stage approach to proximal hypospadias with correction of penile curvature at the first stage and formal urethral reconstruction at the second. So adults with cor corrected hypospadias, hypospadias usually have normal sexual function and fertility. So this is how it looks like. So this is the, the corrected penis once it's already uh, operated and this is how a cordy looks like so there's a curvature in the the penis may it be in the distal gland uh, distal uh, shaft or in the proximal shaft so as you can see using the protractor the degree can be determined uh, by using the the base as the point of reference so these are other uh, figures of hypospagias before it was being opened. Once it's open, it's uh, straightened uh, with different approaches on how to operate them. So the second uh, common uh, pediatric urology case that you will encounter is urinary tract infections in children. And there is a greater chance of underlying abnormalities for this uh, type of patients. So children may have conditions such as VUR, vesicourethral reflux, ureter pelvic junction obstruction, ureteral seals, or ectopic ureters as causes of these infections. So because of this association, in the past, all children with febrile infections would undergo complete evaluations, including renal ultrasonography, as well as invasive studies such as voiding cystourethrography or BCUG. So these are the anomalies that was described earlier. So this one has a uh, vesicourethral reflux with already 
uh, different grades classified in this one so with the order of severity grade 1 to grade 5 uh, this is caused by the the refluxing of the urine from the urinary bladder because of the mechanism that is not uh, that is structurally deformed during uh, development another one is the uh, UPJO or ureteral pelvic junction obstruction which is uh, either a constriction or a crossing vessel that's constricting the pelvis in order for the urine to uh, be ob obstructed going through the bladder or another one is a ureterosil which is a, a cystic mass that is formed in the urinary bladder because of a abnormally uh, formed uh, distal ureter a double collecting system that causes uh, an ectopic ureter that uh, that goes that have an, uh, an exit site either in the urethra or any part of the urinary bladder or it could be also in the vagina however uh, UTI defining pyelonephritis as having a positive uh, renal cortical scan. So only 30 to 40 percent of children with febrile UTI will have reflux. Thus, the majority of children with febrile infections and greater percentage of those with febrile afebrile infections, which is cystitis, will be automatically no anatomically normal. So this data have led to a change in imaging guidelines for children with UTI. So guidelines put out by the American Academy of Pediatrics have markedly changed the way children with infections are evaluated. These gui guidelines suggest that infants less than two months of age with febrile infection should undergo both renal ultrasound and BCUG. So children between two months and two years who have their first documented infection only need to have renal ultrasound performed. A VCUG is only needed if there are abnormalities detected on the ultrasound, such as hydronephrosis, scarring, or other evidence of anatomic abnormality. So a VCUG may also be performed if a child has recurrent infection despite empirical treatment. These guidelines do not address the children older than two years of age, but one can assume that similar algorithms of treatment should be appropriate. There is now greater understanding that most children with UTIs, whether pyelonephritis or cystitis, have some element of bladder and bowel dysfunction as the major factor in the development of the infection. Thus, all children with UTIs need to have a thorough assessment of daily bowel movement and uh, daily bladder habits. So the latter may be difficult to ascertain in younger children, but bowel dysfunction, even subclinical, may be the most important factor in the development of UTIs. So behavioral therapies such as regular and complete voiding in conjunction with bowel program should be considered the mainstay of the prevention of infection as opposed to prophylactic antibiotics. So the next uh, commonly encountered uh, pedger euro case would be prenatal hydronephrosis. So usually antenatal imaging will show hydronephrosis in nearly 1% of all babies. So do, through the though the majority of the children will have benign hydronephrosis of no clinical significance, it may be also related to vesico-ureteral reflux, UPJO, ureteral pelvic junction, obstruction, ectopic ureters, ureterosil, and other upper tract abnormality, abnormality as described earlier so typically nothing needs to be done for these children until after birth so at which um, point a baseline renal ultrasound can be performed so other as studies such as BCUG or LASIK renal scan or the MSA uh, diuretic renal scan can then be done depending on the degree of dilatation so diagnosis of upper tract obstruction usually based on progressive worsening of dilatation of re or renal function on serial examination. So, this is a normal urinary tract. So, patients with hydronephrosis, hydroureters, or bladder distension tend to have a dilated um, 
collecting system or the dilated bladder during prenatal ultrasound, which is shown here. So there are different um, grading according to the severity. So once uh, the dilatation gets bigger, the grading increases. So a special consideration must be given for children with bilateral hydronephrosis or a hydronephrosis associated with solitary kidney, especially if it is linked with oligohydramnios. No? Since fetal urine production accounts for most of the amniotic fluid, low levels can be a sign of severe, severe abnormality of the urinary tract. So reduced amniotic fluid is of great consequence since normal lung development is dependent on normal amniotic fluid volumes and children with oligohydramnios can be born with significant pulmonary insufficiency. So boys with bilateral hydronephrosis and low amniotic fluid are at high risk for having posterior ure urethral valves or what you call PUV. So boys with PUV as much as 25% risk of developing end-stage renal disease at some point in their lives. So prenatal intervention such as a placement of vesico-amniotic shunts have not been shown to reduce the risk of renal failure. The next common uh, problem would be uh, cryptorchidism. So it's a common condition occurring in 3% to 3 of full-term and 30% of premature babies. So many of these testes will descend spontaneously due to the normal gonadotropin release that occurs in the first few months of life. So the true incidence is roughly 1% of boys. Untreated cryptorchidism will lead to testis damage and there is evidence that permanent changes may occur by 3 years of age. So ideally, surgical treatment should occur prior to this age. And they said the testis is usually an isolated finding, but if it occur as a part of a systemic condition such as prader willi Eagle-Barre, or other such complex multi-system syndrome, surgery is the treatment of choice or and hormonal treatment has no role. So these are the location, possible location of the testis. So if there's a true undescended testis, it could be an abdominal, it could be inguinal, or suprascrotal. But if it's uh, a pseudo uh, or a topic uh, testis, it could be prepenile, it could be superficial, topic, it could be transverse scrotal, it could be femoral or perineal. So this is how you do it. So you do a uh, an incision in the inguinal area, you get the spermatic cord, and then you lengthen or you lengthen the cord by either uh, cutting one of the vessels to elongate the cord so that it could reach the the as much as low as it can in the uh, scrotum. The consequences of untreated cryptorchidism include infertility and malignant degeneration. One study on fertility suggested that men with a historical history of unilateral cryptorchidism will have no difference in paternity rates compared to normal controls. So in contrast, men with bilateral cryptorchidism have up to 50% rate of infertility. There is data to suggest that orchidopexy in the first year of life is associated with better better total uh, sperm counts in adulthood. So with regard to malignancy, untreated undescended testes has a five-fold increased risk of tumor development compared to the normal population. So however, there is data to suggest that prepubertal orchidopexy is protective and that these boys have only have two-fold greater risk. That would be all. Thank you.